I walked back over to the corner where the suitcase was and I stood there and I looked at that suitcase because that was my life now. My life was a suitcase. I didn't know what to do, so I picked up the suitcase and I walked into downtown Ardmore, Oklahoma, which wasn't far. And I went to the Hotel Ardmore and I told them I needed a room and they looked at me funny because I was mighty young, but I had cash. So they gave me the key to a room and I went up to the seventh floor and I put the key in the door and I opened the door. I never turned the lights on. I just dropped the suitcase and walked across the room and opened the window and crawled out and sat on the ledge and just looked down seven floors. And on that ledge was one of my turning points because on that ledge, I struggled with myself to make a decision. Do you live or do you die? Welcome to the Seven Hats Podcast. My name is Yuval Selleck, and I've been on the entrepreneurial roller coaster for over 20 years. I've experienced it all throughout my journey, the grind, burnout, failure, and ultimately, success. The turning point for me was realizing that building a successful company is meaningless if you neglect the other significant areas of your life. So today, I'm inviting you to join me on an adventure through those seven areas what I call the seven hats. Every week, my guests and I will drop valuable insights and pearls of wisdom, helping, motivating, and inspiring you to get your seven hats in order and deliver real impact with meaning. So let's get going. Welcome, seven hatters. Today, we embark on a transformative journey of self-discovery and unyielding determination to succeed as we discuss hats one, three and four, the soul, the servant, and the entrepreneur, as we welcome Richard Flint as our special guest. His story, rising from a tumultuous past, stands as a beacon of hope, illustrating that even at the roughest seas of personal and professional challenges, one can chart a course to greatness. Speaking with Richard, I'm reminded of the privilege I experienced engaging with a true maestro of human potential. A prolific author of 19 books, he's touched and transformed the lives of tens of thousands of individuals, guiding them towards fulfilling their human potential. His influence spans not just through his books. As a keynote speaker and revered coach, his teachings have resonated from the United States to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. And despite Richard's early hardships, Will experienced the passion and purpose that fueled his journey, illuminating paths for those seeking clarity, purpose, and fulfillment. Richard specializes in the areas of leadership, sales, self-esteem, goals, strategy, creativity, and success, ensuring no one remains trapped in repetitive cycles. So if you're looking to master the art of self-improvement and capture the true essence of resilience, Let's extend a warm welcome to Richard on the Seven Hats. Richard, welcome to the Seven Hats. I am so excited to be here with you. I have really been looking forward to this. Um, And you're excited, I'm excited to welcome you to the show. You know, as we embark on a journey to delve into the intricacies of human behavior, relationships, and leadership through your profound expertise, I strongly believe in the power of perspective, particularly regarding decision-making, personal growth, and really navigating life's challenges. And I don't think there's anyone better suited than you to enlighten us on these subjects. However, before we embark on a journey spanning over 30 years of your life's work, the seven hatters are eager to uncover the experiences that have shaped you into the person you are today. So Richard, let's kick things off. Where were you born and how was your childhood like? Well, I was born in New Orleans. And, you know, let me say this as an introduction. All of us, as we go through life, we have turning points. And these are the points in life that God gives us to open us to be aware of the next stage for our life. And the journey you have in your life is controlled by whether you're willing to accept these turning points or not. And the challenge I have with so many people is that the turning point is right there in front of them. And because of where they are in their life, 
and which foundation they're standing on because you and I only have two foundations we can stand in life on. There's the foundation that's controlled by doubt, worry, and uncertainty. And there's the foundation that's controlled by belief, trust, and faith. Hmm. And whichever one of those foundations you choose creates the life that you choose for yourself. Life is not given us. Life is for us, but it's for us to design and to learn through. And my life growing up in my life it was a challenge. Being born in New Orleans, my natural mother was a prostitute in New Orleans. Hmm. And the only thing that I know about my natural dad was that I never knew him. If you could see my birth certificate where it says, Father, there's no name on it. And I have no idea of who my natural dad was. And I'll tell you something. Even now, that still plays with me sometimes. Who Mm -hmm. was he? What did I get from him? You know, how am I in any way like him? Well, my mother didn't want me. So at two weeks old, I was given away. And I was adopted into a home where as things unraveled and unveiled, it was apparent to me that my adopted mother didn't want me and that the only reason I was adopted was because my dad wanted a son. Have three sisters. None of us are real brothers and sisters, all adopted from different families. And my mother was one of these people that it was either her way or the highway. You know, my memories go back to when I was six years of age. I hope your listeners cannot identify with what I'm about to say. But when I was growing up, never had a birthday cake, never got a birthday present. And I don't know if you can resonate with this, but, you know, you come down on Christmas morning and your sisters are there and there's presents for them, but there's nothing under the tree with your name on it. And it was my mother's way of letting me know she didn't want me. She didn't like me. And from the age of six to the age of 16, every day of my life, my mother used to make one of three statements to me. You're the stupidest kid I've ever met. Now, you know something? We know that parents don't lie. They always tell you the truth. So if your parent tells you you're stupid, then you must be what? You must be stupid. Or my mother would tell me that I would never amount to anything in life. And then the one that would stick a dagger in my heart. I'm sorry we ever adopted you. And my greatest day will be the day when you're no longer in. And her her pronoun, you were no longer in my house. When I was 12 years of age, we moved from New Orleans to Oklahoma. And we lived in Ardmore, Oklahoma. And when I was 15, my mother informed me that if I was to live in her house, that I needed to get a job and pay room and board to her. So I got a job at a local IGA grocery store. And every day after football or tennis practice, I would go to that grocery store and I would work until nine o'clock. And I'd been 16 for two weeks. And I called my dad on a Thursday night to come get me just like he always did. And my dad drove up in front of the grocery store and like I always did, I started to walk toward the car to get in to go home. And my dad opened the car door and he stepped around behind the car. And when he stepped into a street light, I, I just got this sick feeling inside of me because my dad was carrying something. What my dad was carrying was a suitcase. And he walked over to where I was standing and he set the suitcase down beside me. And he said, Richard, mom has decided you can no longer live in her house. And I wish you could have seen my dad. My dad was a was a great man in his own way. But my dad had no idea of how to handle my mother and set the suitcase down. And he looked at me and you could see the tears in his eyes. And he hugged me and he said, son, I don't agree with this, but I don't know what to do. And then he hugged me even tighter and he whispered in my ear, don't you ever forget I love you very much. And with that, my dad ran back to the car, didn't walk, he ran. He opened the car door and leaned across the top of the car, and he said, you take care of yourself. And the next memory I have is a man grabbed me by the shoulders and squeezing me because I'm standing in the middle of the street. 
And I'm looking at this, my dad is driving down the, down the road and inside me, my heart's about to jump out of my chest. And I just want to scream, if you love me, why are you doing this? I walked back over to the corner where the suitcase was and I stood there and I looked at that suitcase because that was my life now. My life was a suitcase. I didn't know what to do, so I picked up the suitcase and I walked into downtown Ardmore, Oklahoma, which wasn't far. And I went to the hotel Ardmore and I told them I needed a room and they looked at me funny because I was mighty young, but I had cash. So they gave me the key to a room and I went up to the seventh floor and I put the key to the door and I opened the door. I never turned the lights on. I just dropped the suitcase and walked across the room and opened the window and crawled out and sat on the ledge and just looked down seven floors. And on that ledge was one of my turning points because on that ledge, I struggled with myself to make a decision. Do you live or do you die? And I understand people who contemplate suicide. The only individual that can take their own life is a person who believes, not thinks, but believes if they weren't here, no one would ever miss them. And on that ledge, I had my turning point because I figured out if I jumped, my mother would win. And I wasn't about to give that lady that victory in my life. So I crawled back in and I didn't sleep that night. I sat in the chair, just couldn't believe everything that was happening. And the next morning I called a, a man, his name was Troy Howe. And Troy was, his two kids were my best friends. And I told Troy what had happened. He said, don't you do anything. Don't you go anywhere. You sit there. I'll be there in a minute. And in about 20 minutes, he was there. And after three and a half hours, of talking, he finally looked at me and said, what are you going to do? And I said, Troy, I'm not going back home. I won't go back to that. So Troy helped me find a room with a lady who was the editor of the daily newspaper in town. And I paid that lady $5 a week to live in her house. And every day after school, I would go to the grocery store and I'd work till nine o'clock and I would go home and you know, I still have vivid memories of this. I would sit in her kitchen at her table and I'd do my homework and I'd keep myself there until I couldn't keep my eyes open because I know when I went into that bedroom, I crawled into that little cold bed. I was going to cry myself to sleep because the number one thing that a human life wants to know is that they matter. And one of the things we're struggling with in our world today is that people don't feel loved. And that word love is an interesting word because it's a word we throw out. But I'm not sure we really understand what makes up that word love. Because I knew my mother didn't love me. I knew that. And I'll be honest with you, I questioned whether my dad loved me or not. When I was a sophomore in college, and I was lucky enough that I got some scholarships to go to college or I would have never been able to go. And when I was a sophomore in college, I came to the conclusion I needed to face my mom and dad. And this was my turning point number two, because I understood anything you don't confront, you validate. And if I never confronted my mom and dad, I'd never get beyond it. And this is another challenge with people, is that so many people, they hang on to yesterday for their entire life. And they wonder why they struggle. They wonder why they, they can't get that feeling they want for the life they want to have and why their life is always in conflict or it seems to be upside down or they're always worrying and they're doubting their life. It's because there's conflict in their life that they've never confronted. And if I don't confront the conflict, it owns me. And I knew I had to confront my mom and dad. But I'm going to tell you something. I was scared to death. It was 62 miles from my dormitory room to my mom and dad's front door. <laughs> and I got to their house and I did slow down, but I drove right on by their house. And I'm going to tell you, it was like my heart was getting ready to jump out of my chest. And I finally pulled over and I, I talked to myself and I looked in the rear view mirror and I told myself, if you don't do this now, you're never going to do it. So I turned my car around, I went back and I parked across from their house for a little bit, trying to get the courage. And I finally said, Richard, you got to do this. So I shot my car across the street. 
I got out of my car and I ran to the front door because I knew if I walked, I would turn around and run back. And I see this in so many people and people that I've, I've mentored. I take on 10 people a year and I am their private mentor, not coach, but mentor in their life for one year of their life. And what I find is so many people get so close to what they know they need to do, but fear grabs them and it pulls them back. And it's because over the years, that fear has graduated to fright. And there's a big difference between being afraid and being frightened. Fear doesn't control us. Fright controls us to not do what we know we need to do. There was a screen door and a wooden door. And I knocked on the screen door and my dad came and he opened the wooden door. And when my dad saw me, he, he, he just turned as white as a sheet. Never bothered to unlock the screen door. He stepped through the screen door. And later he blamed me for having to fix the front door. But he literally carried me into the living room. And the whole time you could just feel everything that was going on inside of him. And, and, and he was hugging me till he was hurting me. And finally my dad paused and he realized my mother wasn't there. She was in the kitchen fixing breakfast. So he called for my mom to come out. And when my mom walked into the doorway between the kitchen and the living room, and she saw me, if looks could have killed, I would have been dead. Never took her eyes off of me, took her right hand, reached around behind her, untied her apron, let it fall to the floor, took her left hand and reached over to the table where she always kept her purse, picked up her purse, took out her car keys, walked out the back door, got in her car and drove off. And I never saw her again. But let me tell you something. That was the biggest turning point in my life. Because up to that point, I was living to prove to my mother she was wrong. And even though she wasn't physically in my life, she still owned me. And I see this in so many people that they're trying to prove their self to somebody. And when you're trying to prove yourself to somebody, all you're doing is you're giving them control of your life. So when she walked out that back door, she freed me. And I came to the realization, this is my life. It's not her life. It's my life. And from that point on, I lived with, and I have, I have 16 laws that guide my life. And I live by these laws every day. And my number one law is this. Why spend my energy being a carbon copy when I'm the original? There's only one of me, and I want to be me. And over the years, I've learned the difference between living from the inside out and the outside in. And when I live from the outside in, I give everybody control of my life. So it's never my life. But when I have that belief, that trust, and that faith in myself, and I live from the inside out, it becomes my life. And you know, when my mother passed away, I had to make a decision, either go to her funeral or go be with my dad after everybody left him. And for me, right or wrong, it was my decision. I figured that if I went to her funeral, that would have been hypocrisy. So I chose to go be with my dad. And for the last five years of his life, he was my very best friend. As long as I didn't talk to him about what happened when I was 16. Because he had erased that. It was the only way he was able to live with himself. But that has turned my life. And I'll tell you listeners this. If you really got to know me, I am probably the most self-confident person you'll ever meet in your life. I throw parties and I'm the only one I invite. And God, they're great parties. But I am comfortable in my own skin. I, I, I don't like me. I love me. And in my life, I've worked to overcome those three things that my mother taught me. I'm not stupid. I've got multiple degrees. I can do things with my life. I've written 19 books. I got five more that I'm going to write. And I am a person who is lovable because I learned how to love myself. And for the last 35 years of my life, I have traveled this globe from one end to the other sharing with people who are wanting to be free. I think we were put on this earth for three things, to be happy, 
And I don't know about you, but today I don't see a lot of happy people. You know, when I'm on an airplane, I always get an aisle seat in first class. And I love to smile at people when they get on the plane. And it's amazing how many people won't smile back at you. You, you watch people today and you look in their eyes and their eyes are dead. Why? Because in their life, they have allowed themselves to be programmed with doubt, with worry, and with uncertainty. And, you know, this is me. It's not you or any of your listeners. I think we have a world today, we have a country today, where we're teaching people to doubt. We're teaching people to worry. We're teaching people to be uncertain. And what we're doing is we're stealing the human spirit. And I'm watching the spirit of people be sucked out of them today. And there's so many people that are like you and I, we're, we're entrepreneurs. We live from the inside out because we have a dream. And that dream is not a fantasy. It's a dream. And that dream keeps us alive. It pushes us with three things. It pushes us with desire. And I have this desire of, I know what I want to achieve in my life. I mean, my next book I'm writing right now is entitled, So What's Your Excuse? Because we live in a world where excuses have become necessary. And I not only have the desire, but I have the determination. You know, life throws a lot at us. And the terrain is always changing. And if we're not careful, we pay more attention to what's outside and we give it control than we do what we can manage from the inside. And then I'm disciplined. And what I see lacking in so many people, that allows them to fill their life with clutter. And clutter is anything you start that you don't complete. That is clutter. It can be a conversation. It can be anything. But their life is so packed with clutter, they have no clarity. And if you don't have clarity, you don't have calmness. If you don't have calmness, you don't have confidence. And I live every day to help people try to understand what it means to have a positive presence that is present when you're not present. Because that's the most remarkable thing that can happen in your life. Is that from the inside with your belief, your trust, and your faith, that you can have a presence, a positive presence that attracts people to you. And I would imagine from the little bit I know about you, is that you're a person who, in your own way, you're committed to helping as many people as you can. It's one of the reasons you do this. It's your way of giving back. But a lot of people don't know how to give back because they've never figured out who they are. And that's my story to the moment. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. I will say that I've interviewed some of the best storytellers in public speaking, Patricia Fripp and the likes. Yeah, I know all of them. And your storytelling technique, you had me the whole time. So it's incredible because stories are pivotal in spreading a message. It's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. And you can have the same message, but not be able to bring it across so others can take it in, number one. And number two, take it on. And I think that your gift, when you got it, I don't know, we'll probably dive into that, is extraordinary. And you are, in 21 minutes since this episode started, I guarantee you, you have shifted some listeners. Without me asking one question, you have shifted some listeners. Because some of the points that you made were extraordinary, but just the emotion behind it and the understanding that life at times, actually more often than not, is difficult, challenging. We, we're all blessed because at some point there's always something worse out there that can be looked at and identified. And resilience to that type of extraordinary and difficult life that was adopted by you is also a miracle because 99.999% .99 
of the individuals that went through what you went through are not where you are today. Guaranteed. I, I, I agree with that. Okay. So what you have done is a testament to an incredible amount of fortitude, determination, self-love, work on your own skill set to overcome the challenges of feeling that you're not enough, feeling that you're not loved. That's where it's, that screws people up all the time. Can I tell you this? Because I get asked all the time, how in the world did you ever rise above everything your mother taught you? Because, Please. you know, if there's any person that ever had the right to go lay in the corner in the fetal position and suck their thumb, it was me. Yes. But what I did is, and it was another turning point in my life where I thought, I, I am not this person my mother says that I am. So I started this process that every morning I would get up and I had a, a, a yellow legal pad and I'd stand in front of the mirror and I wouldn't leave that mirror until I could find one thing that I liked about myself, not love, because you can't love till you like, and that I liked about myself. And I'll never forget this. First morning I stood there, I stood there for almost 30 minutes because the only thing that was going through me were the negative messages that my mother had given me. And I finally found one thing that I liked about me, and it sounds stupid, but I liked my ears. I liked my ears. But once I got the first one out, then I started understanding that there's a lot about me to like. And once you learn how to like yourself, then you're able to love yourself. You used a word a minute ago that I think is the second most beautiful word in language, resilience. Resilience is you can knock me down, but you can't keep me down. And, you know, a lot of people, they want to talk about success and failure. And I'm a believer that all emotions travel in threes. And so when you talk about success and failure, and I... I <laughs> This was probably 10 years ago. I was on a platform in Brisbane, Australia, I was speaking. And the guy in front of me was talking about how you don't want to fail. You always want to make sure that you're successful. You cannot fail. And I was on behind him. And when they introduced me, I walked out and I said, folks, I mean, no disrespect. But I'm going to ask you to forget everything this man just told you. Because if you can't fail, you can't succeed. And people ask me, well, how do you define failure? One word, fertilizer. All failure is, is fertilizer. And every time you get knocked down, there's that growth element to it. And besides just success and failure, you got to put the third word there, and that's defeat. And defeat is when you give up. And you don't want to hear anything positive. You don't want to hear anything good about yourself. And again, this is me. It's not you. It's not any of your listeners. But I think people are being taught to be defeated today. Mm -hmm. And they're not being taught positive. And everywhere you turn, there just seems to be this bombardment of negative information. And with that negative information, what happens to us, we get pulled outside. We get pulled out. And when you're living outside yourself, the world controls you. And when you live from the inside out, you can control the world. When I started this journey 35 years ago, I was going to change the world. I don't know if you've ever been here or not, but I just knew that I could change the world. And that when I walked out on that stage, people had been waiting for me for years. Well, it only took two presentations to realize <laughs> most people don't want to change. I get asked all the time, what amount of people do you think listen to anything you ever teach? 2%. And I search every day for the 2%. If you could walk around my house here in South Florida, you'd find in four different locations, there's a sticky note. And the same statement is on all four of these sticky notes. And it's what guides me every day when I get up. Somebody's going to need me today. Somebody is going to need me today. And you know, there are days I get up and I'm the person who needs me. And I've learned I can't give 
everybody, all of me. I got to be able to recharge. I'm a, I'm a theologian at heart. I graduated from seminary. And I keep studying that every time that Christ got worn out and he got tired, what did he do? He disappeared. And he went and he was alone. And I've learned the value of a personal room in my life where I go to be by myself. It's where I recharge. And if I don't have that recharging, I lose my value to other people because I can't give to people what I don't have. So it means I've got to make this my life. And, you know, so many people give because they think in giving they're going to be loved. And it doesn't work that way. Mm -mm. Love is what you feel about yourself conveyed through your behavior. Absolutely. Let me ask you a question about your biological parents. So you mentioned your mom, biological mom was a prostitute. Have you ever met her or how do you know? No, I never met her. When my dad died, my sister just older than I am, she found a letter from my real mom. And I know who she was. And I knew the story of who she was because my adopted mother used to tell me all about my real mother and about being a prostitute. And, you know, she would, there was all kind of negative remarks and everything. So I knew that, but it was my choice and I chose not to meet her because I had overcome that part of my yesterday. And if we're not careful sometimes, we can walk back into yesterday unprepared to deal with what we learn. I, I think there are two sets of filing cabinets in our yesterday. One following set of filing cabinets are all of the disappointments, all of our worries, all of our doubts, all of the negatives. And there's another set of filing cabinets, which is all of our successes. And what I find for most people is that when they try to make a decision, they run back to that file cabinet of all the, uh, the issues, all of the negative, all of the wrong things in their life. And what does that do? It gives them a reason, it gives them an excuse, and it gives them a justification. You know, <laughs> I love this when people tell me, well, you don't know how tough life can be. <laughs> and I say, you don't know me, do you? So I choose not to live from yesterday to today, but I choose to live from today to tomorrow. And that's how I live my life. Have you continued a relationship with your sisters by any chance? Well, that's an, that's an interesting question because my, my oldest sister and my youngest sister, the only time I ever heard from them was when they needed money. And one day I told my oldest sister, I can't be your ATM machine. I refuse to do that because I'm just making you more and more dependent on me and you're not helping yourself. So she called me every name in the book and some words I'd never heard before. And I never heard from her again. And my youngest sister was the spitting image of my adopted mother. And when my oldest sister graduated from high school, she ran away from home to get away from my mother. She got married and, and left. My sister just older than I am became a prostitute and she had a child and my mother sued her to take the child away from her. And that child today, that young lady today is a mess. And then my youngest sister, I can't be around her without hearing my mother in her. So, and again, this is me. It's not any anybody around us. One of my laws of life is never keep anyone in your life. Who's not part of your fan club. Mm -hmm. Because anyone who's not your fan is your critic. And there is, <laughs> there is no reason to keep negative people in your life. I don't care who they are. Let me ask you a question. Jim Rohn said that you become the average of the five people you hang out with most. And it doesn't seem like you've been hanging out with the right crowd as you were growing up. How did you manifest a different reality for yourself? Well, Jim, great guy. And I, I, I have taught this for years. If you want to know what you think about yourself, look at the five greatest people in your life that you're closest to who are not part of your family. Look at the five people you're closest to who are not part of your family. Look at them because they are you. 
Most people put others in their life to give them permission to stay where they are. And I, I've always had this, this belief in myself since, you know, since I started learning about me that there was something I wanted to do with my life and I didn't know what it was going to be. When I went to college, I was going to be a teacher. So I did my undergraduate work in English and speech. And then when I did my practice teaching, I decided I am not going to spend my life in a classroom like this. So I decided to go on to grad school. So I went to seminary because I thought, you know what? Maybe it is that God has a, a role for me that he wants me to pastor a church. I'll never forget when I get ready to graduate from seminary, this committee came to me from a small church and wanted to know, would you consider coming and being our pastor? And I asked him about the church, and I said, well, what about salary? And they said, well, we can't pay you much, but there is a lot of woods out behind the house where there's a lot of, a lot of deer and stuff, and you can go out there and get your meal, or you can plant a garden. And no way was I going to do that. So the next stage for me was to teach at the university level. And I taught at Ohio University. And then I was offered uh, a position at Wayne State University in Detroit. And that was where the, the gentleman, the president of the university, asked me to give them 18% of my salary. So I gave them the whole salary and never looked back. You know, it, it's interesting because there are so many different stages in our life, but you've got to be preparing yourself every day for the stage. But most people don't understand the value of preparing yourself for the next step. Mm. Success is not what you have. It's whom you become with your behavior. If you ask anyone who's been in an audience of mine around the world, and you ask them, what do you remember about that guy? They're going to tell you three words. Behavior never lies. That the essence of truth is not what you say, it's what you do. And I, I listen to everything people say, but I study their behavior because I know that's whom they really are. And this is why I, I spend my life working with human behavior. Everything I do. I mean, every Friday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time, I do an open mic where people can call in with me. 90-minute show. And we have a question that we deal with. And I do a little opening and then I turn it loose and everybody deals with the question. And it's become like a family because there's trust there. I do a series of small group retreats. Our next one is in October. And my theme is stop chasing your tail. How do you understand the meaning of pace, patience, and persistency? People don't understand. Pace is one of the most important things in life. You can live too slow or too fast. And how do you find the pace for your life? And the interesting thing is pace and patience are twins. Have you ever noticed that if your pace is too fast, you lose your patience? Or if you lose your patience, you tend to speed up. And that's because we're not persistent with the things we need to do. And, you know, every day I want people to be better. I want them to be smarter. I want them to be stronger. And in any way that I talk to people, any way I'm in front of people, I want those two things for them. But I've stopped wanting to change the world. I want the 2%. Yeah, that applies to business as well. Yep. Entrepreneurs believe that growing quickly is the secret to their success. And more often than not, especially if you raise funds, more often than not, the quicker you grow without a solid foundation, without showing up every day for the five to 10 years that it really takes to get a business off the ground, you're building a skyscraper on sand. Yeah. And that's going to fall. And what happens, the faster I build it, the more I increase my doubt, my worry, and my uncertainty. Absolutely. The time that I put into it where I can learn to build that solid structure on the rocks, and I believe in me that this is where I'm supposed to be, and I have the trust that I can make this happen, and then the faith to step out. You know, from the day you were born to the day you died, and the same thing with me with all your listeners, you're going to find six fears. And one of those is your number one fear. And if you never find your number one fear, the other five will eat you alive. And they're in no order, but there's the fear of the unknown, which to me is one of the biggest fears out there today. And we're being taught, we're being taught to be uncertain. The fear of rejection. 
And it's interesting because I couldn't reject you if I wanted to. Rejection is not what I do to you. It's what you tell me to do with myself. The, the fear of abandonment. I've watched so many people stay in unhealthy places for the fear of not having anybody in their life. The, the fear of uh, loss. Would you agree that with everything you want to do with your life, there's a price tag? You always pay the price, either now or later. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you're not willing to pay the price, you can't go on. No. It ends. And then the number one fear in young people today, the fear of success. Because young people have not taught success. Why? Because they've been given everything. Parents can do too much for a kid. And they yeah. can give them too much. And then they start expecting everything to happen. And when things get tough, they don't know what to do. And success is a behavior that you bring every day that allows you to improve your life. Yeah. But it and, also stems from the age of social media, Google, where every answer is instant, especially with AI now. When you and I were growing up, more so you than even I, to get a response or an answer was very difficult. You had a question, you had to work for that answer. And now it's milliseconds away. I remember the, the set of encyclopedias that we had. Correct. Britannica. But now all I got to do is pick up my phone and all I got to do is ask Siri. Yeah. And I'll tell you something. AI is frightening because the misuse of AI, the damage it could do would be irreparable. Yeah. The misuse of any technology can be irreparable. I think AI is just one of them. Look at the misuse of tablets by parents who allow their children to be distracted through their formidable years without any conversation for probably the first five or seven years because they do not want to deal with their issues. This is an actual story, and it's true. I was counseling with this couple that were, were talking about getting a divorce. And so I asked him, how do y'all communicate? This is gospel truth. They told me, well, at dinner, we each sat on the different side of the table and we text each other. I said, but you're right there. Why don't you talk? Well, it's easier to text. I said, and you wonder why you have issues? You know, what happens when you take away one's ability to think and they don't have to think anymore? You know, it's interesting. You mentioned the fears that we go through. And, and I would say that in a dualistic world that we live in, every one of the aforementioned losses or fears has an upside to it, has an right. empowerment to it. Yep. The, the fear of the unknown can be very exciting. The fear of abandonment can be very rewarding when you yep. find your true self. The fear of success shows you what you're made up of. The fear of loss means that there's a new beginning. There's always a duality to everything in life, and most people don't see it that way. And that's where, you know, you talk about those that take their lives. I have a friend that took his life back during COVID. He lost his business or got into some trouble probably, had a relationship which probably was not satisfying and fulfilling. He did have a, a beautiful child. And from what we knew of him, he was one of the most positive individuals you would ever meet. And, you know, you couldn't pay me enough to believe that he would ever take his life, yeah. ever. But he did. And that's because he didn't see the duality in life. He only saw the one side of things. Well, and I like your term du duality, because what happens is fear is positive until it turns to fright. Yeah. Situations start frightening us. That's when they become dangerous. Yeah. And become something that can become destructive to our life. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. To every one of those fears, yeah. there's a positive. And you know what's funny? I've always considered the opposite of love is hatred, but it's not. It's fear. Mm -hmm. And it's just such an interesting aspect to the spiritual sense of who we are, who we truly are. And that we're walking this earth blind to what is really possible for us because Madison Avenue a long time ago decided that 
if they keep us in fear, they can make a lot of money. And for decades and decades and decades, we started losing our sense of spirituality, our sense of who we are in our, our higher self. And that's, and that's scary and sad. And I wish more people became more present to the moment and listened, just listened to that little voice inside that says, you're way more than that human shell that's walking on this planet. You're way more. And you got to believe that you are. But it's funny because there there's got to be a defining moment in your life where you started understanding that you want to be the expert in human behavior and, and help others. When was that moment for you? That moment was probably whenever I, I, I left teaching at the university and I went to the church staff. And I started working as running the counseling division. And I got into people's lives at a different level because at t teaching at the university level, most of what I taught were PhD students. But in that place, you were trying to shape minds that in all reality wanted to fight with your shaping. But when I got into the counseling room and if people came to me and said, I've got a problem, I'd tell them, you're the wrong person. I'm the wrong person for you because I don't deal with problems. I deal with people who are seeking solutions. So if you want to see if we can resolve this and find the answer, then I'll be happy to talk with you. But if all you want to do is spew your problems, I'm not the person for you. Because if all I have is problems, all I'm going to see are problems. And my defining moment is when I started realizing there are people out there who want to improve their life. And everything I do, I mean, everything I do is about helping people improve. I just finished a five-year project that we've opened up called The Success House. And it's, it's taking what I have found is to be the eight greatest point of conflict in the human life. That I've, I've put it into eight modules and built it into a 16-week program that actually is there to free you. And it's, it's what we, we've been talking about. It's finding the positive in the midst of what everything else is. And the more I find the positive, the more I have to realize I have to separate myself from the world. You know, if you really want to grow, it can be a very lonely life. For sure. Yeah. The more you want to do with your life, the fewer people you're going to have in your life. And you have to be okay with that. But to do that, you have to love yourself, don't you? You have to be in love with yourself. Absolutely. I think three decades, you're now a seasoned speaker. When you first started, how was that like? And... How did you learn to speak effectively where you can now contribute and, and affect other people? Well, like I said, my undergraduate degree was in uh, English and speech. And, you know, one of the greatest things I ever did is I got involved in debate and it taught me to think on my feet. And, and this is what I find with a lot of people is that they can't think on their feet. I love going to a restaurant and going ahead and giving the waitress the order, but give it to her backwards and watch them just stand there. And they don't know what to do because you've taken them out of how, they, how they've learned to live. <laughs> but it's your ability to be calm within yourself. And I'll tell you something else. I just did a, a, a special program on our website, two days on becoming the presenter you're capable of becoming. And it was, it was two afternoons designed to help people understand what it is to make a presentation. And because every presentation is a demonstration of you. And some people don't present, they mouth words. But when you're passionate about something, people feel it. Through the screen, I can feel your passion for what you do. And I can feel the mindset that you have, that you, your mind is a constant searching machine. And I have a feeling you're probably never really satisfied. <laughs> Good observation. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. <laughs> one, of, one of the aspects to, I think, great speaking is vulnerability. We bring up Brene Brown all the time in terms of vulnerability being so powerful. What advice, because you're obviously uber vulnerable and you're laying it all out there. But for so many, it's so difficult to open up because they, again, feel like they'd be shunned or judged, et cetera. 
what advice do you have with all these years of experience for those who really want to share their experiences to help others or to grow, but find it difficult to do so? Would it make sense to you if I told you that for a long time I couldn't talk to him about my childhood? Mm -hmm. That I, I just couldn't talk about it. And then one day I realized that I'm not the only one who has gone through a dysfunctional childhood. Now, my, my story may be a, a story that is, you know, really deeper than, than in, in pain than most people's. But I decided that my past can become a living part of who might become. So I became okay with sharing it. And you, uh, you, you probably wouldn't be, but a lot of people would. The number of people that come up to me after our presentation when I share my, my childhood with them and tell me, thank you, because my childhood was not like yours, but it was similar. And you've helped me today. And we all have a story. And it's believing that our story can help other people. And you use the word several times, allowing yourself to be vulnerable, to be real. I'm not on stage to entertain. I'm on stage to help. And my journey and what I've learned in life and, you know, my 16 laws I live by are strength because I live every day from the inside out and I protect myself from the outside in. And the stronger I become internally, the more value I can bring to other people. Let's talk about the adult life, your adult life, because, all right, we, we understand that what happened in your childhood. But as you become an adult and you have a business and you become an entrepreneur and you now have to grow that business and make it a profitable venture, right? There's going to be a lot of teeter-tottering between chaos and calmness throughout the day. How do you as a leader maintain composure and influence over those that you're working with, speaking to, where you're showcasing strength and, and power because nobody wants to follow a weak leader, right? Nobody wants to follow a leader that's going to be scared in the corner of a room sucking their thumb. Even if you feel that way, you can't showcase that to the world. Otherwise, you lose your ability to lead. How do you maintain that balance between the chaos and calmness within the storm of the day? It depends on what set of file cabinets I go to. <laughs> okay. Okay. If I go to that file cabinet of all of the wrongs, then I get sucked into that. But if I go to that file cabinet of successes, I can demonstrate that. So this is why which foundation you stand on is important. If I stand on the foundation of doubt, worry, and uncertainty, I'm always going to go to those negative files. But if I have that belief, trust, and faith in myself, and I promise you, your beliefs get challenged. Your trust gets challenged. Your faith gets challenged. But I know that in the essence of what I want to become, I have to become stronger at being me. And rather than letting the world throw darts at me that I let them hit me with, I can, I can defer those darts because of the belief, the trust, and the faith that I have in myself. And I believe, and I believe this with every inch of my body, I can make a difference in people's lives. And people can feel that. And it's why I get so many people who come to me who want me to mentor them, not coach them, but mentor them, is because they can feel that I'm not a story, I'm reality. Too many people are just a story, they're not a reality. You mentioned doubting faith, and you're obviously a faith-based man. Was there a time that you looked up at God and said, I just don't believe you exist. I'm just like, this is done. I'm done. I'm done with you. Was there ever a time? Yeah. And if so, why? Or what happened? Because there was a time when I was down on myself. You know, in our world today, we talk a lot about depression. And I believe there's two types of depression. There's depression that is clinical, and, and we need, we need help there. But I believe that probably 95% of all depression is personal. Hmm. It's when you get down on yourself. 
And when I get down on myself, that's when I lose my belief. It's when I struggle with me. And you know what? I got to have someone to blame. So I blame God. God, I asked you for this and you didn't give it to me. But he did give it to me, just not in a form that I was wait I wanted. Yeah. But because that it didn't happen the way I wanted it to. Yeah. Two types of being selfish. There's selfish where I protect myself and there's selfishness where I use other people. And I am a very selfish person when it comes to me. I protect myself. It's why I live a very private life. It's why I don't have a lot of people like, you have a lot of close friends. I don't. I have three. Because, you know, to open your life in trust to someone is big. Yeah. Uh, you know, th again, this is me. It's not you. But I have a real challenge today knowing who to believe, who to trust, what's real and what's just being thrown at me. Yeah. I think for me, and the reason why I probably have few close individuals in my life is because whether I'd like to believe it or not, growing up, moving as much as I moved in my life every two years or so, I was never able to form relationships and I couldn't trust individuals who hurt me in many ways. And after many years of that, you build up a protective skin and you only allow those that you believe won't hurt you. And that's that's an interesting. You're going to test them too. You're going to test them to see if you can really yeah. trust them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. You know, it's interesting. You said, speaking about the past, you mentioned a, a term, yesterday's never safe. I think it's in regards to the, those that feel anchored to past choices. Filing cabinet. Back to the filing cabinet. And how do you form that filing cabinet? How do you get that? How do you build it? I start looking for the successes. I start looking for the rights. And what I do in every event, I look for the lesson. What have I learned that will improve my life? And I think there's a lesson in everything. You know, once I got beyond it, I, I saw that there was a lesson in the way that m my mother was. And that lesson was, she was whom she chose to be. You know, you and I don't do anything in our life without giving ourselves permission to do it. So if I believe that, I can't blame anybody. There's no excuses because yeah. everything is my choice. Absolutely. And going back to what you were saying earlier, some things that you believe to be the best for you are created by the ego and the ego doesn't know what's best for you. Yeah. And that's something to really consider because sometimes if actually the things that you wanted did materialize, you would be in a very different place than you are today and it could have been much very, worse. Very true. I think life is based in poor questions. And when I mentor people, I we go through this and they come in an order. Question number one, what do you really want for your life? Not what do you want? It's that word really that puts the thought into it. Question number two, why do I really want this? What's the motivator? And number three, what price am I willing to pay to have it? Yeah. And then question number four, what behaviors do I have to improve in order to reach what it is I really want? Yeah. So wise. You mentioned, there's so much here. You mentioned your book, Behavior Never Lies. You know, Maya Angela once said, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Can you highlight the significance of gauging action over words? particularly in the business context, because I'm sure you work with a lot of entrepreneurs and business leaders. Many times words are me thinking out loud without me really understanding what I'm saying. But behavior is a demonstration of what is real to me. It's why, it's why so many people who are entrepreneurs, it, it's why they fail and, and, and why they suffer the defeat. They just suffer because they it's what you said. They want this success so fast. You know, I used to do a, a lot of speaking for the multi-level groups. And I would watch these, these people stand on stage and let their ego out of what they had achieved and everything. And here's this little person in the audience that has scraped up everything that they can just to join and be a part of it. And they listen to this. And they, they think, I can do that. But they don't understand how to achieve it. Hmm. 
and what price they have to pay to achieve it. And that's huge. That is huge. I believe that if entrepreneurs really understood the pain and the sacrifice that it takes to become successful, I have a feeling that many would not start. Yeah. The journey. And because when the realization sets in that this is not easy, <laughs> this yeah. is work. Yeah. And it's time, it's energy, it's money. It, it, it's a whole foundation, foundational structure of what you feel about yourself. For the, the seven hats, we discuss just the different areas of life that are present in, in our abilities to work on so we can become not just successful, but fulfilled. You have an analogy of the four rooms in the house. Can you explain the concept further? And then one more thing, and you might say file cabinet, but how do you ensure that the stresses of one room doesn't seep into the others, ensuring a balance in our lives? Yeah, well, the four, the four rooms, you have the business room, which is the number one room of mental stress. Because, you know, being an entrepreneur, anything you were doing to do with your life, when it comes to building that business, there's a lot of mental stress in that. Then your family room is your number one room of emotional stress. Because it's very challenging, and I, 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 I've seen this for years, it's very challenging to build your business room if you don't have the support of the family room. I've watched, especially I've watched this, I've watched so many people, so many women who had, could be very successful, but their husbands were jealous of them. Mm. And their husband didn't want them to overshadow them. So they take the dream away. And that family room is the number one room of emotional stress. Your social room is your playroom. I don't know if you see this, but today, I think a lot of people have lost their child. They don't know how to play because of the uncertainty and the stress in that family and that business room. And then your personal room is the most important room in your life because anything that you and I want to do with our life will be born in our personal room and then we live it out. And that demands that I have time for me. Personal room is wherever you go to be by yourself. If anyone else joins you, it's a social room, but you got to have time for yourself. Yep. I mean, do you have a personal room? I do. I have a morning routine. I wake up at 4 a.m. each morning, and I spend three hours getting my life in order. And then at the end, my bookend, at the end of the evening, I have an hour and a half or so to close out my day. And sometimes I spend it with my wife, meditating, breathing, whatever it might be. But I capture a good portion, a few hours a day, as busy as, as I can get, to make sure that hat number one, which is the self-love hat, is taken care of because without hat number one, nothing else is possible. Yeah. I write for two hours every morning. I'm like you. I'm up early. I sleep three and a half, maybe four hours a night. That's all I sleep. Good for you. I wish I could do that. <laughs> but I write for two hours every morning and that's my creative freedom time. Yeah. Well, I'm actually working on three books all at the same time. And depending on where my mind is, is which manuscript I pull out and I work on. But I find if I don't have my personal time, I lose my value to other people because I lose my value to myself. Yes. Your cup needs to overflow and the overflow goes out to everybody else and you keep the cup. Because somebody's going to need me today. Yeah. And I want to make sure I'm prepared. Absolutely. Well, boy, this hour plus flew by. I like to close out my interviews with the following question. Who... Did you have to stop being, and who did you need to become to manifest your current success? I had to stop being the person my mother told me I was. Because again, parents don't lie. So if my mother said those three things, it had to be true. And I had to become the person that deep inside I knew I was capable of becoming. And to do that, I had to find me because I wasn't me. I was, I was a compilation of what my mother told me, but I'm me today. I am comfortable in my skin. I love me. I know that there's more for my life to achieve. 
And every day, that's what I want. I want to be better today than I was yesterday. I just got a hit. I hope you don't mind if I share with you. No. I truly believe that as souls, as individuals living on this planet, we arrive here to live out an experience, whatever that experience is. And the experience is one experience out of all experiences that are possible, which is why you have murderers and you have saints. And I believe that those that hurt you, your mom, both moms, both dads, in a sense, not so much your non-biological dad, your sisters, or at least anyone that is, has passed and looks down, can say with certainty, I've done my job in being the bastard that I was to get him to be the man that he is today. That's the hit. I, I, can, I can agree with that. But sometimes they don't realize the bastard that they've been. Correct. I'm saying during their life, correct. Mm -hmm. But once they pass and they see the real deal. I agree with you. They've done their job. Yeah. Because up there, none of this matters. It's yeah. the experience that matters. My mother made me stronger. Exactly. And helped so many others mm -hmm. as a result. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was such a pleasure. I mean, really, such a pleasure having you on the show today. Where can the Seven Hatters find you? How can they speak with you further, get mentored by you? My website is richardflint.com. Just real simple. And there's a second website that if they're really serious about wanting to improve their life, this eight module program that I've spent five years developing will take them to a level they've never been in their life. And it's called successhouse.co, not C-O-M, just C-O. And they'll go there and there's a video. And then if they're interested, they can book a call with me. And it's this program is by invitation only. If I interview 10 people, I'll probably only take three of them because they're not ready for me. I am the toughest, deepest person they'll ever have in their life. And if you're not ready, I, I don't want you. I want the 2%. Yeah. And and then if you if you want to send me an email, I'm just Richard at richardflint.com. And you know, I welcome questions. No one reads my emails but me. And I answer every single email personally. Now, it might take me a few days to get back to you, but I answer every email. But I challenge you, look at look at what we're doing. Look at our next small group retreat that's coming up at richardflint.com. Look at our Friday morning question open mic. Look at my morning minute and see some of the things we do all designed to help you strengthen your life from the inside out and be able to resist the outside wanting to own you. Richard, it was such a pleasure. Thank you so much for gracing us on the seven hats. Real delight. And let me tell you something. I like you. I like your interview style. I like your mind. I like the way you think. And I don't say that Thank to you. a lot of people. Thank you. I appreciate it. Don't appreciate ever lose it. your searching. That won't happen. Again, ask my wife. Okay. <laughs> She'll tell you. All right. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Richard. Let's end today with a show segment that I refer to as, what can we hang our head on? And here is my takeaway. Owning one's actions, decisions, and the consequences that arise from them is the hallmark of a life lived with intention and purpose. This is not a lesson read in books, but one learned through the trials and tribulations of life. Richard's journey underscores this truth. From the heartaches of feeling unwanted as a child to rising above it all and becoming a beacon for thousands. He exemplifies the strength of embracing one's past, being present in the now, and working towards a future sculpted by informed choices. Drawing from one of my teachers, Eckhart Tolle, the power of now is ever present in Richard's story, living in the moment, free from the shackles of past regrets and future anxieties. And as Tony Robbins often suggests, it's not the conditions of our life, but the decisions of our life that determine our destiny. There's a power within each of us comparable to the dormant seed of a sequoia tree. Its potential is grand, but until and unless we tap into it and water it with self-belief and shine the sun of perseverance upon it, that seed won't grow into the towering giant it's destined to be. 
And just as important as believing in oneself is the encompassing embrace of self-love and the unwavering support of those around us. We must cherish those who see the spark in us, even when we might be clattered in doubt. Those who champion our growth and push us to realize our true potential. We all have that innate potential, a hidden giant within us. But much like the sequoia, it's only in the right environment of self-awareness, nurturing and challenge that this giant comes forth. The journey isn't easy and there will be hurdles. Still, with self-love, accountability for our actions and invaluable guidance from the teachings of the likes of Richard Flint, we can pave a path to our highest potential. At the end of the day, the responsibility lies with us. It's a beautiful combination of understanding the present, accepting the past, and visualizing the future. Embrace the present, love yourself, and cherish the champion in your life, for together you'll grow into the towering force you're destined to be. I want to thank Richard once again for joining me so that we can all benefit from his wisdom. And until next time, if you found this episode helpful, please hit that subscribe button and tell other entrepreneurs out there what value you receive from it so that we can attract even more high quality people into our Seven Hats community. So for now, I will bid you farewell and success on your journey. And until next time, my name is Yuval Selick and I tip my hat to you.